morning, everybody. Um, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here today, and it's going to be an easy job because I'm preaching to the choir. And especially one of my professors, Dr. McGuire, is sitting right there, so she'll probably give me a grade at the end of this. It'll be an A+. Plus. <laughs> so, I, I, firstly, I, I want to say how grateful I am to have this opportunity to speak to all of you, and how tremendously impressed I am with the kinds of work that you folks do. Uh, from Massachusetts, for oral health, you guys developed the oral health plan in 2010, and you guys continue to lobby and teach our legislators how important it is that oral health is a universal right to our citizens in Massachusetts. Because without your efforts, they wouldn't understand, or they wouldn't understand enough to understand that there's a significant segment of our population that does not have access to oral health. I have a unique perspective in terms of dentistry. Uh, I started off serving the Brookside Community Health Center in Jamaica Plain. I was there for five years, and I also served the Brigham Women's Hospital. There we saw patients uh, that were compromised, the mentally compromised, uh, the new immigrants that came to the United States, uh, veterans, a whole segment of a population that were not receiving adequate care and as a consequence had to come to emergency rooms to receive their treatment. And at the Brookside Community Health Center, we saw something and that is limited resources. Dr. Colchimero, who heads the Brookside Health Center, has a rule. We never refuse an emergency. Now, with limited resources, with limited equipment, with limited funding, and with so many cuts, we still lived to that promise in delivering care to everyone. Whether you had an appointment, whether you didn't have an appointment, if you were there, we'd see. So, that is a pretty unique perspective. And then I moved on to private, to private practice. And there we made it a fundamental pillar that we provide, continue to provide dental care to the Medicaid and Medicare population. Regardless of reimbursement, regardless of how complicated it is to travel through the system. In 2002, there were severe cuts. The economy tanked in 2001, and as our communities needed health care, dental care, the most, dental care was cut. In 2006, it was resumed. 2010, it was cut again. And now we're talking about some limited care. We go through these cycles. Provide care, not provide care. Provide care, not provide care. Our clinicians go through those cycles. Our patients go through those cycles. But can you imagine what it does to families? Can you imagine a world where healthcare was run that way? You can see your cardiologist in 2002, but in 2006 you can't see him. Or, I'm, I'm sorry, the reverse. You can't see him in 2002, you can see him in 2006. You can see them in 2010, and then you get some limited treatment here and there. There is a disparity in perception. And the perception is our legislators do not understand <laughs> how critical it is to have a continuum of care. They don't, they don't understand that a tooth is an organ. It has a vascular system, it has a neurological system, it has a lymphatic system, but yet they do not perceive this as an organ. They feel that this is an elective process, elective procedure. Having a critical part of your health care is elective. Elective to those, our veterans, who come back and do not get treatment, they, they're on mass health, a lot of them are on mass health, and they do not get treatment because they don't believe that the treatment that they need or it's combat related. I had a veteran who was shot six times by an AK. His front teeth were all shattered. The veteran services were not providing care, he was on mass health. 
And this was just in time when Mass Health no longer provided treatment for endodontic therapy for his front teeth. He had to have them all removed. I come from the South Shore. I live in Quincy, Mass. We have a drug problem. We have something called meth mouth. Meth mouth is devastating. And a lot of those kids are going through rehab. And once they go through rehab, they're going to try to find a job. Now, you can't find a job if your whole anterior dentition is falling apart, is melting away. And when you can't find a job, you go back to doing drugs. Because your options are limited. You live in despair. We live in one of the most powerful countries in the world, the wealthiest country in the world, where 10% of our population lives in poverty. To help this 10%, we need to provide them with adequate care, with overall health care. And we can't provide them this kind of care when it's convenient for us. <coughs> this kind of care cannot be dependent upon the economic cycle. But yet, historically, that has been the case. Now, we're getting smarter. And we're talking about obesity, we're talking about diabetes, we're talking about overall health. We know that 33 million Americans suffer from diabetic, diabetes, and 30 million from type 2 diabetes. We talk about quality of food, how important it is. But very often, something we, we neglect is your geography, where you live, determines the kind of care you get and the quality of health you get. And this applies to oral health as well. <clears throat> These are concepts that are so critical that we continue to educate our legislators in letting them understand that health care can't be optional. And you folks have done a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous job in pursuing this fight. I would say this. I am not from the United States, and I'm from Hong Kong. And the world is changing. It's becoming more competitive. It's becoming more globalized. If we are to succeed in this global economy, we need a strong workforce. If we are to pay down our national debt, we need a strong workforce. And our strong workforce is located in these communities, amongst us all. And if our legislators and we, as a community, do not change the perception and understand the importance of overall health and how dental care, oral health care, plays a part in this grand picture, we are not going to be competitive. This is a choice we need to make now, and this is a choice and a fight that I'm sure that all of you will pursue. Thank you so much. if there are any questions. Are there any questions? <laughs> Please. So, I know that you were on the Hill recently <clears throat> and lobbying on a national level about oral health. Any lessons learned for us? Absolutely. Um, I had the pleasure of going to Washington pretty much for the last three years. Um, legislators are concerned about a couple of things. And that is Mentally, they're counting votes. I, I like to, you know, we're, we're, you guys are my colleagues, so let's, let's just get down to reality. It, it comes down to votes. And it comes down to voices. You can have a room packed with donors that are paying, you know, donating a dollar. They, 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 they make two different, they, they make two kinds of counting in their minds, and that is, you know, how important is this segment of the population? How important are these issues? If they hear that we have a significant volume of people that care about these issues, they hear about these issues consistently, 
if they hear that this segment of the community is lobbying, they have a tendency to give you more time. If they feel that we are the, those who only come in a rainy day, knocking on the doors on a rainy day, well, I guess the issue isn't so important. This is, this is true, this is reality. And we know this is reality because the economic cycle affects dental health and mental health a lot more than it does with many other segments. And I feel that um, BOMAC has done a wonderful job, MDS has certainly done, done a wonderful job, but we need more collaboration. We need more collaboration with other healthcare associations. We need to build additional coalitions. Our coalitions cannot be limited to those who are interested in oral health only. Our coalition needs to expand. Because seriously, oral health isn't isn't a, a limiting uh, factor in healthcare. We have a huge uh, association with diabetes. We have a huge association with respiratory health. We have a huge uh, correlation with uh, preterm birth and low weight, low weight birth. Uh, there's so many associations. We need to go out and find partners. We need to expand upon our strength. We need to then consistently lobby over and over again at the national level and at the local level. Uh, I think if we do that, we can change things. But it's up to us. Thank you so much, everybody.